Good morning, everyone. Thank you, girls, for that beautiful introit. I think we'll be hearing more from them in the service today, so we have that to look forward to. Speaking of things to look forward to, I'd like to say a special good morning to all the adventurers up at the front. Hi. And I think we have something special to look forward to from you today also. So, um, say, all of you are welcome and all of you are special today. So let me say um, a very warm welcome to everyone to Methodist International Church this morning, whether you are here with us in the sanctuary or whether you are joining us on our live stream. Let us open our worship today with um, this call to worship. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. Let us indeed sing now our praises to the Lord as our worship team will lead us. Thank you. 
to, Lord, to the Lord as He speaks to us. Speak, O oh Lord. Speak to us during these times. In times we, when we are confused, we search for answers and we do not know what's next. When we are to make decisions, speak to us, Lord. Teach us, Lord, to be obedient to you. In times of rejoicing and times when the sailing is rough, teach us, Lord, humility. Remind each and every one of us. Remind us that each time that we have nothing to boast about, but only the cross of Jesus. Teach us to trust in you and put our full confidence to Christ alone. Speak to us, Lord, this time. Fulfill your purposes in us. Speak, O oh Lord. Teach us, O oh Lord. Speak to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue praying as we pray the prayer that Jesus had taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Morning, church. Great to have you worshiping here with us and live streaming. Uh, if you're first time here or you want to know the church a little bit more, every fourth Sunday of the month, which is next week, uh, we have the welcome reception on the fifth floor after the service, fifth floor Sky Garden after service. So if you want to know more about the church, you can uh, see us there. So now let's take a look at our video notices. Oh, okay. Can we say something first? <laughs> yeah, we are flying all over the place. Okay, today's very special day, and I believe that not all the stars are in the sky. Do you believe me? Well, let's see why. But today we are celebrating Father's Day. So happy Father's Day, everyone, to all the fathers out there. But not just to those biological fathers. We are celebrating those who like to be fathers, those who are grieving as well, and for those who stood up to be fathers. But before that, the adventurers have something for all of the fathers, and they will be giving something to all fathers today. So let us watch this video first. Um, 
I was one years old and then I ran into his arms and hugged him for 10 minutes. And I went to Disneyland with him and I ate the donuts with him at Disneyland and I watched all the shows that I like and I went on all the rides that I wanted to go on. Thank you, Dad, for bringing me out. Me and my father went to Disneyland. Then we had to drop him off at the airport because he had to take care of my grandpa. My dad is, is a superstar because he makes me food. My dad is a superstar because he make, get, gets food for me when I'm hungry. Daddy is a superstar because when I had when my brother had Shumi Kawashi, I had Shumi Kawashi too. My dad is a superstar because I love him. Father's Day, thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. Love you. So happy Father's Day to everyone and our adventurers and the Sunday school children and the Sunday school teachers has something for everyone, for the fathers. So please accept these gifts and these souvenirs to all the fathers out there, for those who want to be fathers and for those who stood up to be fathers. <laughs> yes. So we will give you your souvenirs now. And as they do this one, let me just say a prayer to all our fathers. The Methodist International Church is so thankful to have you here. And you know, the study shows that when a father stood up for the family and they always go to church, there is a big possibility that their children will also go to church and will believe in Jesus Christ. And so um, we say thank you to all the fathers here, you know, for bringing your children in the Sunday school, for, for coming to church. It's it's a big thing because you are continuing the kingdom of God and the growing of this kingdom. So let me say a prayer to all our fathers today. Shall we all pray? Lord, we give you praise and thanks for all the wonderful fathers of our church. We praise you and thank you for their lives, for standing up, for their children to know more about you. And we just praise you for their lives. And I pray, Lord God, that may they grow um, in knowing you so their children will also know you as their father as well. I pray, Lord God, that you will continue to bless them and guide them as they, um, as they stand as the father of their home and as they raise a family which I declare belongs to your family that belongs to God for your kingdom alone. And Lord God, this day we also remember those who lose their fathers we remember those who are standing up to be fathers and for those who want to be fathers. Bless them, Lord God, for their future. Lord, we con continue to praise you for all the fathers in this church. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now it's time for our adventure. Okay, so... Now, we'll take a, look, take a look at our video notices.
embark on a new VBS adventure with rainforest explorers. Jesus leads the way. The rainforest is a wild place. Monkeys howl, mosquitoes buzz, snakes litter around, and hmm, what's that? A sloth. To make it through this unknown world safely, we need a guide who can keep us on the right path. At Rainforest Explorers, learn how Jesus is our ultimate guide in the rainforest and throughout our lives. We might feel lost, but He will show us the way. He will never leave us. He treasures us so much. Start your rainforest exploration here at Methodist International Church. Open to all 3 to 11 years old. Register now! I just want to bring you three highlights. Uh, the Women's Retreat and the VBS, please sign up quickly because uh, we are more than half full already. The second is uh, we are still looking for welcome hosts. Um, the briefing session will be next Sunday after the service right here. So if you're considering uh, to be a welcome host uh, at the door and at, be, at, at the end of the service, uh, please consider and we'll see you next Sunday after the service. The third thing is, um, some of you know that uh, Margaret and Eric uh, were admitted to the hospital. Uh, Margaret just did the surgery. Uh, he's, she's getting better now. Uh, please pray for them. Um, remember Eric and Margaret in your prayer. Uh, now is the time of uh, the offering, a time between you and God. Um, you can do the online giving uh, and also uh, the retirement offering at the end of the service. Uh, today we are glad to have Anika and Kalista Jung from the Asian Music Society. Um, they are the soloists and they actually uh, perform uh, right here in the concert uh, in, on June 6 before. So great to have them. Um, and it also is a time between you and God, uh, a time you reveal your commitment, you reveal your promise to God, and also a time of prayer.
Thank you, Anita and Calista, to offer the gifts to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your perfect love. Thank you for loving us, the imperfect ones. You gave your all on the cross by showing us how to love. May we learn this fatherhood, motherhood, and learn to love our family more, learn to love our neighbors, and also learn to continue to offer more to you, offer our gifts, offer our talents, our time to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let us hear God's living words. Job chapter 38, verses 1 to 11. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt.
Our second reading comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, uh, Eric and Elena, for the readings and choir for that uh, lovely anthem. That's, that's very good for today. Uh, let's have a word of prayer before I get started. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Well, this is a time of year when um, for one very special reason, I miss my ancestral homeland. Like, like Eric, actually, I come from the state of Iowa in um, the United States. It's a sort of a north central state. And, um, well, Iowa is a quiet place most of the time. Its, its attractions are subtle, um, we might say. But at this time of year, something really exciting can happen. Because the late spring, the early summer, this is the time of year when we get our best thunderstorms. Yeah. Now, it, I know it rains a lot here in Hong Kong, right? It rains a lot. It hasn't rained all that much this year, but it, it, it will, it will. But, okay, the rain is heavy, and right, we occasionally get a typhoon, and those are quite exciting. I admit, but I miss the thunderstorms of Iowa. On a summer's day like, uh, like today, perhaps, sometimes out on the open plains, you can see them coming over the horizon. Sometimes you can watch them for, for an hour or more coming up, coming closer. And it starts with a line of dark blue or even black clouds along the horizon. And that line comes higher and higher and closer. And as it comes, you can start to see lightning flashing. And as it comes even closer, if it's a really good thunderstorm, those black and dark blue clouds, they'll turn to a kind of horrible green color. And the air will get still but uncomfortable, and then the storm breaks. And if it's not too bad, you'll just get a lot of heavy rain and maybe some wind, and it's, that's okay. But if it's a bad one, there'll be hailstones, and those hailstones, they can be this sized. They get dangerous. And if it's a really bad one, there might be a tornado. And tornadoes are terrible. They're deadly. And if a bad thunderstorm like this is coming, of course, of course, the news on TV, on the radio, on Facebook, on the internet, wherever, it's telling you one thing. Seek shelter now. You're supposed to if you're in a house with a basement, you're supposed to go down into the basement 
and stay there because that's the safest place. If your house doesn't have a basement, you have to go to an inside room so that in case there is a tornado and the, the walls of the house are blown apart, maybe if you're in the inside of the house, you'll be okay. So, when the tornado warning comes, does everyone in Iowa immediately go to their basement? No. No. What they do, many people, well, some people go to their basements, but many people go out on their front porch or they go out into their front yard and they look. They say, oh, Ma, look at that. And sometimes it's too late. Look, you, if you go to uh, YouTube and you search for tornado videos, right, you'll actually find a lot of tornado videos. Okay? You shouldn't find any. All of those people should have been in their basements <laughs> instead of being out with their mobile phones taking video of the approaching tornado. Okay? Why do they do it? Because there is something about a storm that is fascinating. Storms are unpredictable. They are volatile. They bring with them an uncontrollable danger and power. And for many of us, we can't look away when a storm is coming. Well, today, we are going to stand on our porch here and we are going to look into a couple of storms. The first one comes to us um, from the book of Job. Now, to understand this storm, we, we actually have to back up just a little bit and remember what it is that's happening here in the book of Job. The book of Job is not a short book. Much of the action is right at the beginning. We are introduced to Job, who is a good man, and he has uh, been blessed a lot. He has, he has lots of possessions. He has, he's, he's rich. He has a big family who love him. And what happens? It is all taken from him. All of it. Even his health is taken from him. Job is left with nothing. And for the next chapters, many chapters, up to chapter 37, Job and his friends who join him, they are seeking to understand what has happened to Job. They are, they are complaining. There is a lot of complaining in Job. But to tell you the truth, it is complaining that has some grounds. Because what has happened to Job is terrible. And Job and his friends, they are asking questions. Why? And again, there are good reasons why those questions are being asked. But as the chapters go on, Job and his friends, they, they try to rationalize. They try to fit into their human understanding the breadth and the depth and the horror of what has happened to Job. And to tell you the truth, they don't really succeed. But here in chapter 38 that Elena read for us, everything changes. In, um, <laughs> in a verse that I think is sadly neglected in, in our uh, memory verses from the Bible, God speaks out of a storm. He comes to Job in a storm, and he says, Job, brace yourself like a man, because I'm going to turn the tables on you. Up to this point, it is Job and his friends who have been asking all the questions. In chapter 31, verse 35, Job kind of sums this up. He says, let the Almighty answer me. In chapter 38, God says, I will question you, and you will answer me. And God asks Job 
uh, quite a few questions, but in many ways they can be they can be summarized in one three-word question. God asked Job, where were you? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Where were you when I shut up the seas behind the doors after they burst forth from the womb of creation? Actually, if you want to read some some beautiful poetry, some magnificent, powerful words. Read chapters 38 and the next couple of chapters of Job as God speaks to Job. I'll I'll jump ahead, actually, one verse beyond the set reading for today, verse 12. God asked Job, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? that it might take the earth by its edges and shake the wicked out of it. It's good stuff. God says to Job from the storm, don't you know who I am? And Job really doesn't have a great answer. So is this who the Lord of the storm really is? Well, we get another storm in our passage from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has um, been teaching by the Sea of Galilee, and he's probably tired. He wants to go to the other side of the lake for a break. So he gets with the disciples, he gets in a boat, and they head off across the lake. And even then, we find out earlier in chapter 4 that there are others who follow him. Jesus is already drawing people to him in a way that that is is smothering. He can't get away from them. But anyway, when they get out on the, the Sea of Galilee and a furious squall comes up. And uh, that sounds kind of like those Iowa thunderstorms, actually. But Jesus is so tired, he is, Jesus is cashed in. He's got his head on a cushion in the back of the boat, and he is sound asleep. He sleeps right through the storm. And it's really, it's interesting to see how the disciples react. They, uh, their lives are in danger. And they think, perhaps, you know, maybe Jesus, um, he's kind of amazing. Uh, Maybe he could do something about this. They maybe know that in their hearts. But listen to what they actually ask. What, what, what they, um, when, when they wake up Jesus, what they ask him. They say, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? How could you be asleep? How could you be indifferent? How could you not know that we're scared, we're in a storm, we're in trouble? How could you not care about us when we needed you. Well, Jesus uh, wakes up. He, he does care enough to calm the storm. He says, peace be still. And it is calmed. Now, interestingly, what Mark doesn't tell us at this point, if there's no more wind, how do they get off the middle of the lake? Um, presumably, they're stuck. But anyway, um, the, the wind must have come back up at some point, or maybe they had to row but Jesus is a bit taken aback. He's, he, he asks his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And in a way, he is just asking the same question. He is rephrasing the question that God asked Job in, um, in the storm. Jesus is asking his disciples, Don't you know who I am? And the problem is the disciples don't really know who Jesus is. It's still early in his ministry, and they're only getting to know him. And how can they have faith in him? How can they understand him? How can they trust him? Especially when there's a storm blowing like this, when they don't really fully know him or understand him. And that, like Job, like for the disciples, that is a question that we face every day. That's our dilemma. 
How can we trust God when we don't fully understand him? When we don't have all the answers? Well, what is God's response? Is he a bully? Like he seems to be in Job? I mean, God is kind of intimidating, isn't he, in that passage? Is God indifferent? As Jesus seemed to be to his disciples, is he asleep, uncaring, when we're in trouble? In response to this dilemma, I have, I have just uh, I have two points to offer. The first one is, we must remember our place. We must remember who we are. Okay? We must remember our place. We must remember who we are. Last week, Reverend Eden, in his sermon, he's, he, he mentioned how we long to be in God's presence. Right? We long to be in God's presence. We sing about it. We pray for it. We talk about it. But when we actually come into God's presence, well, what do we expect? We perhaps expect that to be a comfortable place. And God's presence isn't always a comfortable place. As Job found out, as many of the people we hear about in the Bible, as many of them found out, God's presence is not a comfortable or safe place. We can't look God in the face. We are told that over and over. Job couldn't look God in the face. Moses couldn't look God in the face. Even the disciples with Jesus right there with him, they can look at his face, but they don't really see him for who and what he is. There is a great gap between God and between us that is enormous. God is eternal. He is uncreated. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. We are created. We are finite. We are limited. And because we are broken by sin, we are confused. And then knowing in our hearts that that gap exists, we presume to question God, just like Job. We think we often have God figured out. We come with the questions that we think we know he will answer and we think we know how he will answer them. And we don't always get the answers that we expect when we come into God's presence. The, um, the first few chapters of uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, Paul brings us this theme from an, another point of view, another perspective. Paul says again and again, the wisdom of this world, our wisdom, is foolishness in God's eyes. If we have wisdom, it comes from God, not from our own perspective. When we think we've got God figured out, then we're getting ourselves into big trouble. As Reverend Eden also mentioned last week, we don't run the kingdom. It is not under our management. It is in God's charge. And when we presume to take his place, that is when the real trouble begins. So that's my first point. We must, we must remember our place and we must remember who we are. My second point. We must remember our place and we must remember who we are. That's not a misprint. We must remember our place and we must remember who we are. Because there's another side to this statement. We may find, from our perspective, it is impossible to, to get God, to fully grasp him, to fully understand him, to, to, well, to plumb the depths 
and soar to the heights of who and what he is. But God certainly gets us. He understands us. He knows us. And when we say that God is the Lord of the storm, it doesn't mean that he is um, he's the Lord of the storm like, like a pagan god, like Thor, right? Thor's the Lord of the storm in, in Norse mythology. Elena, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think that's right. Thor has a hammer, right? And when Thor sees a problem, what does Thor do? He pounds on it. Okay, that's, that's the pagan view of the Lord of the Storm. You got a hammer, everything's a nail. It's time to pound. Okay. That is not God our Father. That is not our Lord of the Storm. Even in the book of Job, it, it seems that he's, he's, he's pushing, bullying Job in a way that makes us uncomfortable. But he is also revealing and clarifying and guiding Job in understanding. Remember, Job can't just look in his face. God is helping Job to see and to understand who God is and how the universe works. And to help, he's helping Job to understand the order of things, the relationship between God and us. Jesus may seem indifferent to his disciples, but look, look at what is actually happening. They are trying to, to understand who Jesus is. They may see him as a teacher. They may see him as a leader. They may see him as someone who has come to liberate them, right, from the, the Roman oppression, to lead the Jewish people to victory over the Romans, to set them free. But Jesus is smashing these expectations. He is trying to show them and to teach him who the Messiah really is. He doesn't fit their expectations. So we can see they are not completely comfortable in his presence. They are terrified by his power. Stilling the storm takes this to a level that they, it's a new level for them. This was something they had not expected. And when Jesus goes to the cross, sometime later in the Gospel of Mark, it will take it to another level yet. The disciples don't even seem to be aware of what is going on right before their eyes. And that is, God's plan of redemption is being worked out in the person, in the ministry, in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And just because the disciples don't understand this, it does not mean that it's not happening. It is. Hour by hour and day by day that they spend with him, that plan is in motion. God is more sacrificial. He is more loving than the disciples can even imagine. So, that's my second point. We must remember who we are and we must remember our place. Who are we? We are God's children for whom he gave his only son. So our father is the Lord of the storm. He speaks from the storm when we need to hear it. He is far from comfortable. He is far from safe when we are in his presence. But he also commands the storm, and he delivers us from it. In Mark, we see Jesus calm that storm with a word. And he does care for his disciples, and he does care for us. As, as the, the first song we sang this morning sums it up perfectly, sovereign power and tender care. Jesus cared enough, God cared enough, to carry out his plan of redemption, whether we get it or not. And he cares enough, like the good father that he is, to speak the truth to us from the storm and ultimately 
from the cross. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, we are going to sing uh, a song now that I think is probably new to us, um, but when we sing it, it's, it's, it's a lovely song, and you will see why we're singing it today. So, we are going to sing Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor. So, I invite you to stand and sing along. to God with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord, on this Father's Day, we give you thanks for our fathers and father-like figures who have supported us throughout our lives. For fathers here at MIC, we pray for your wisdom in guiding their children in a godly way. We thank you that through Jesus, we can call you Father, even though you are high and exalted above heaven and earth. Help us to have a childlike trust in you as we go through the storms of life, knowing that you alone have the authority to say, be still, and to set the boundaries on our suffering. And most importantly, knowing that you are in the boat with us and you haven't forgotten us. May we hear your voice speaking to us out of the storm and revealing more of your character so we can know you better. 
Lord, we pray for young people who are taking exams and planning out their future at this time. Please guide them along the right path and help them to find your plan for their lives. For older people, let them know that you still have a plan for them too and give them a sense of purpose as they offer up their lives to you. As we think of the world, we pray for countries in their plans for lowering COVID restrictions and opening borders. Amidst the jumble of information, help the leaders to make good and wise decisions. For those countries still battling high numbers of COVID cases, we pray for your intervention to bring healing and bring the numbers down. Father, we give you thanks for the good news that King's brother Siegfried is now out of hospital and recovering well. We lift up to you those in our congregation who have been hospitalized this week, praying especially for Margaret, Eric, and David. May they experience the power of your healing hand to bring them to full recovery. Lord, we give you thanks for the successful launch of MIC's Coffee Corner this week. We pray that those who pass by will feel welcome and comfortable to grab a coffee and have a chat with the volunteers and ministry team. We pray also for the upcoming women's retreat, for a time of refreshing and spiritual renewal for all who attend. Also for Alpha, as we think about who to invite in September, we pray for your spirit to guide us. Finally, we lift to you all those who are on our hearts at this time, our family members, neighbors, colleagues, and friends. May each of them receive a special blessing from you according to your perfect knowledge of their situation. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's stand for our closing hymn, Lead Us, Heavenly Father. gives endurance and encouragement. Give us the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and with one voice we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.